If you'd like to know more about how our circadian rhythms affect our sleep, our hormones, and our overall health, then this episode of the Smart Nutrition Made Simple Show is for you. Welcome to the Smart Nutrition Made Simple Show, where each week you will hear the real world experiences, life lessons, and guided principles that every highly driven man needs to master their health, productivity, and relationships by sharing conversations with the world's most successful people in fitness, nutrition, supplementation, and mindset. Meet your host, Benjamin Brown. He is a fitness and nutrition expert, consultant to Fortune 500 companies and world championship sports teams, a husband and father of three, and has been helping men transform their physiques, optimize their energy, and own their fatherly mission since 2005. Thank you for joining us today, and without further ado, let's jump right in. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to episode number 62 of the Smart Nutrition Made Simple Show with Dr. Carrie Jones. Dr. Jones is an internationally recognized speaker. She's a consultant and educator on the topic of health and hormones. She graduated from National University of Natural Medicine, School of Naturopathic Medicine in Portland, Oregon, where she also completed her two-year residency in women's health hormones and endocrinology. Later, she graduated from Grand Canyon University Master's of Public Health program with the goal of doing more international education. She was adjunct faculty for many years, teaching gynecology and advanced endocrinology and fertility, and has been the medical director for two large integrative clinics in Portland. She is also medical director for Precision Analytical Incorporated, creators of the Dutch Hormone Test, which we talk about in this episode. So we're going to talk all about cortisol. We're going to talk about circadian rhythms and hormones. We're going to talk about adrenal fatigue and HPA axis dysfunction, as well as training intensity and the nutritional impact on those circadian rhythms and our cortisol results. Additionally, we'll dive into both her and my experience with a five-day fasting mimicking diet, which we're both finishing up as we speak. And so I think you guys are going to enjoy our conversation back and forth regarding that. Although we may not necessarily be in the best mood after five days of fast mimicking, nonetheless, we cover some great information for you to enjoy. We'll catch you guys on the other side. Dr. Carrie Jones, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. We had a little bit of a glitch on uh, the other day when we were trying to get on a talk, so I'm glad we were able to circle back. And um, so tell me, uh, we both are actually in the middle of a, we're, we're, toward, we're on the end of a fast mimicking yes, diet, thank yes, goodness. <laughs> um, tell me what you're doing with respect to the fast mimicking. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so I'm actually, I'm doing um, the patented form. I'm doing Prolon, so I'm doing the five-day packaged goods following their protocol, but I'm doing um, hormone testing, cortisol, um, and sex hormones every day. So I did it the day before as my baseline, and then I, I got it every, all five days of the um, fasting mimicking diet, so today is day five, and then tomorrow's transition day, so I'll do it tomorrow, and then Sunday is uh, (laughs) free-for-all. I can go back to real food Mm -hmm. and I'll do it then as well. And then I'm actually tracking my um, estrogen and progesterone every day of my cycle. So cortisol for eight days and then estrogen progesterone all month long. So I'm going to see what it does to my cycle as well. So I'm one heck of a biohacking guinea pig at the moment. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm really interested to see what the results come back uh, for that. How have you been feeling? Um, You know, I had so many people write me and tell me that they felt amazing. They had all this energy. They had all this mental clarity. They, um, you know, turned into a superhero. And I will be dead honest with you. I haven't had any of that. (laughs) That has not happened for me. Now, I didn't, I had my very first day I had headaches. And I was really, 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 really 10 out of 10 hungry. Like if you, if we had done this podcast live in person, I would have eaten you. So Mm. (laughs) <laughs> but it was all a mental game because I couldn't eat. I mean, I'm not a food-driven person. I'm not a foodie. I mean, I like to eat, but knowing I couldn't eat was mentally screwing me up. Yeah. But since then, I haven't been hungry at all, really. And um, I haven't had headaches. I've been tired. Uh, I've been total space cadet, which is not like me. I'm usually very type A and organized. And um, yeah, so I'm not, I haven't had that elation and that like moment of, you know, seeing total clarity. Yeah, yeah. How about yeah, you? So, so, well, um, so okay. For so for those of you listening that aren't familiar with the patented Prolon diet, and correct me if I'm wrong, but basically it's it's uh, food pack it's packaged food 
mm-hmm. uh, that is for five days. So you have bars and, and uh, soups, Soup. essentially, mm-hmm. and olives and, and what have you, that constitutes the five days of eating. But essentially what it is is uh, five days of very low calorie mm-hmm. eating, uh, somewhere around 40% of what you know, maybe – so maybe on a 2,000 calorie diet, about 40% of that. I think the first days around 1,100 calories. Mm-hmm. The next f- uh, four days are 800, and it's it's higher in fat. It's about 55% fat, um, only about 10% protein, and then the remainder is the carbohydrate. High in fiber. I was looking at actually. I was looking through your Instagram, and I was seeing some of the ingredients. I realized that the fiber mm-hmm. is actually pretty high, which makes a lot of sense. Obviously, you want to create a level of satiety mm-hmm. with that stuff. Right. Um, so. The way that I've done it is I actually am doing it um, with a pseudo cleanse, if you will. Mm. So I've incorporated medical food powders um, as the predominant calorie source. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I've been doing a couple, three shakes a day and then uh, supplementing, if you will, with some additional fat sources, whether it's MCT oil, olives, macadamia nuts, butter, to keep the fat uh, relative to where it is based on his diet, just because mm-hmm. I wanted to experiment with kind of getting, just seeing some of this, what the results would be if we weren't using those patented foods per se. Right, right. Um, and how, how do you feel? <laughs> generally, I've, I've been feeling good. I, I, my energy has been low the last couple of days. Today, mm-hmm. it's, I got a good night of sleep last night, like the best night of sleep I've had in a long time. Nice. Which was needed because I had some crappy sleep a couple nights prior. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because I felt like my brain couldn't shut down. It felt like, you know, whether it was BDNF or um, I just felt like neurally, uh, neurologically, I was more switched on. And I do feel like I've had a bit more mental clarity um, and focus. Uh, but and from from an energy standpoint, it's been relatively low. So I'm looking yeah. forward to this being over. Yeah. <laughs> you and me both. You know, it's funny. So I my the last two nights, so the night of three into four, and then four into five, um, I felt I had an extreme amount of stress going into bed, um, and then I felt I did not sleep that well. I would have I would have told you in the morning if I wasn't tracking my sleep that I didn't sleep that well. But in fact, my deep sleep went up. Yes. When, when, uh, this morning, it was, I think I was at two hours and 20 minutes when I tracked it. And then yesterday morning, I was, at, I think, almost two hours and 40 minutes. And, and wow. close to two, hour and a half to two is, is my normal. But it, wow. it actually went up. And I would not have said that. I would have said that I was fitful and, and tossing and turning, whether it was from blood sugar and lightheadedness and st- mm-hmm. you know, stress and cortisol and lack of food. Um, but according to my tracker ring, I actually slept better than I thought I did. So... Yes. I, I experienced the same thing a couple nights. I felt like I slept like crap. Uh, obviously, I felt like my mind was going a lot more through the night, but then looking, I have the aura ring as well. So looking at my data, it did show that my deep sleep, although it still is not where it should be, it was better than what it has been. And then last night was was really good for me, but that still only was still only like an hour and 20 minutes of deep sleep, if that. Normally, it's well, normally it's well under an hour. I, I'm working on improving that, but... Huh? Um, huh? yeah, so this is good. So with respect to the, the fast mimicking diet, um, what do you anticipate seeing, um, from the data that you're collecting in terms of, uh, cortisol, uh, sex hormones, what, what do you think is going to show up? What I think is going to show up. So I'm doing the, I'm doing the cortisol awakening response as part of the testing. Okay. So for people who don't know, the cortisol awakening response is, is in when, when your eyeballs open up, it's that first 30 minutes where your cortisol should shoot up. It should go up, peak out, and then after 30 more minutes, start to fall back down. And so traditional co- cortisol testing usually has you test in the morning, right. around lunch, or maybe two hours later around dinner and before bed. So it's this very spread out check. Whereas if when you specifically do cortisol awakening response, you do it when your eyeballs open up. 30 minutes later, 30 after that. So it's very intentional in the morning and in that first hour. So I'm doing that every day. So I want to see as time goes on, does my cortisol awakening response stay the same? Does it, does it get higher because I'm, I feel low blood sugar. So my cortisol has to go higher and higher and higher in the morning to like get me going. Um, yes. because it knows I'm not eating. Um, does it flatline? Um, I don't feel like I'm flatlining. I don't, I, I'm t- more tired, but I feel like I'm more, um, mentally tired 
as opposed to physically tired. I don't, I don't feel, I don't miss, I'm not, I don't drink coffee, but I do drink green tea, not on this plan, but just normally I don't, yeah. I'm, I don't have the headaches. I don't feel like I'm need my green tea or my caffeine in the morning. Um, so I'm assuming my cortisol awakening response is fine, but I will be curious if it goes up a lot higher. I will say I feel heart racing sometimes in the morning, which makes me think I'm having like it's overshooting, right? right. It's like, ah, oh, man, she has no blood sugar for utilization. Let's, let's go really high. Right. Let's, let's drop some norepinephrine, epinephrine, which helps release glucose and will sustain me. And so I, I, wonder if it's actually an, a higher cortisol awakening response as the time goes on, just because mm -hmm. less and less and less food in me. Why don't we take a step back and let's talk a little bit about uh, circadian rhythms and, and, and with, uh, in its relationship to cortisol and what people should, what we should be seeing and kind mm -hmm. of the relationship between circadian rhythm and cortisol production and how it's relevant in terms of our, our daily energy and, and functionality. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's all light driven, right? So um, the, with the sunshine or, or light, light from your phone, anything that comes into your retina gets triggered up to the part of your brain, the, the SCN, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And that's where, that's where you regulate your, you know, your light dark, your, your sleep wake cycle. And so in the morning, when your eyes open up and light comes in, you get this instantaneous like, all right, it's go time. And your body, your brain has been trying to make, get your cortisol um, to go up. It's been trying to get your uh, adrenals to respond to it, but your eyes are closed, so it's very dark. And so once your eyes open and the light comes in, then the blunting comes off and you just mm -hmm. like whoop, make a whole bunch of cortisol or you should not, a, not everybody does. And they definitely right. feel very low energy in the morning. Um, and, and that should happen within about the first 30 minutes. And that's what I was referring to the cortisol awakening response. And then, and then it comes down and then it gradually goes down through the day. And as the day gets darker and darker and darker, then there's less and less light in theory coming into your retina. And that starts to prepare your body for going to sleep. And so your uh, core body temperature changes, your peripheral body temperature changes, your melatonin production starts to, you know, gear up right. because it's getting darker. So cortisol is like the sun, melatonin is like the moon. And so they switch. It's, it's like the day job worker and the night shift worker, you know, switching, switching positions. And then your cortisol should be down at night so you can sleep and your melatonin should go up. So what do you see with people that... I mean, this is the average American, obviously, that we push it, you know, we push the light later <laughs> on into the night than obviously yeah. since the invention of electricity. Um, so we're, we're staring at, at lights a lot later. We tend to go to sleep a lot later. We tend to eat a lot later. Mm -hmm. um, and what do we typically see with response to, the, you know, the cortisol rhythm? Um, we get a lot of sort of dysfunction in the cortisol rhythm. We get a lot of abnormal or inappropriate cortisol rhythms. So we'll, people will say, I can't fall asleep or I can't stay asleep. That's such a big one. You know, I go to bed, but I wake up at three in the morning or right. one in the morning or, you know, I wake up constantly and it's, in, and it's often they're up later than they should, especially think parents, right? Parents, they put their kids to bed and it's their only time alone. <laughs> so, you know, they get stuff done or they're watching their shows or they're, you know, they're, they're doing whatever, but it's late because the kids go to bed. And so now they, they're hoping for two to three hours to themselves. And, and then that gives them that second wind. So now, now they're ready for bed at 11 o'clock at night or midnight, but the body's like, wait a minute, but you've been doing stuff and the lights have been on and you've been on your phone and your computer and you've been watching your show on this bright 65 inch TV. So I think it's daytime. Like, let's stay up. And so now you have the mom and the dad who say, I, I can't, I, I really have trouble sleeping. And I'm, now I'm tired in the morning. Because all that bright light just delays melatonin onset. And so it just pushes everything forward. So now you have to get up at 6 a.m. But your melatonin's like, no, no, I'd rather you get up at 8 a.m. Like mm -hmm. Everything's been pushed forward because you've gotten on your screens light. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when we're doing that consistently over time, what do we see is the relationship between this, this, uh, pattern, this cortisol, you know, suboptimal cortisol rhythm and what happens with fat storage, what happens with energy, what happens yep. with um, other hormones and di digestion, all of those types of things do we typically see? We st well, we see, unfortunately, we see a, um, a di well, di dysfunction, right? Everything sort of goes south. So, so except our weight, that goes north. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's right. Then our blood sugar. So cortisol, um, everyone vilifies cortisol. You know, everyone's like, oh, I don't, cortisol makes you fat. I'm like, well, no, actually cortisol helps your blood sugar and it's anti-inflammatory right. to a point. And it, it actually helps um, uh, trigger 
your own T cells that have been tagged as autoimmune to be killed. It's, it's called central tolerance. So if your cortisol rhythm is dysfunctional, you can actually increase your risk for autoimmunity or you can increase the autoimmune symptoms you already have. And so getting your, your rhythm under control, people are like, oh my gosh, I'm losing weight. Like I'm getting into that deep sleep. I get that full mm. night of sleep. I re rest and repair, which happens in sleep. Um, and then when I wake up in the morning, like I'm, I'm starting to lose weight. My blood sugar is under control now. I'm not as inflamed. My joints don't hurt as much. My digestion is better because they're, you know, they're not in fight or flight. They can actually rest and digest. Their autoimmune symptoms improve. Um, and it means I think people really discount how critical sleep is. We say it all the time, get sleep, get sleep. People are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like drink water. Sure. Like, no, really. <laughs> it's, no, really. It's, it's like, really, it's, it's super, super critical to, it's like breathing. You, you have to sleep. Yeah. And this, this just sheds beautiful light as to the importance you know, medically, physiologically to the importance of maintaining that optimal cortisol rhythm mm -hmm. and getting enough sleep because when we don't, we become more insulin resistant, we crave right. more foods and, and it just leads us down this vicious uh, a path of uh, right. dysfunction. As you said, what, what are, what's the relationship between this uh, suboptimal cortisol rhythm? Let's say we're not sleeping enough consistently, we're overly stressed out, and what happens with thyroid function or what could potentially happen with thyroid function for people? Um, a lot of times it's, a, it's actually a peripheral uh, conversion issue. So we talk all the time about the test TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Yeah. And that's just a marker of what's going on in the pituitary, right, in the brain. But then, but when, then once the thyroid gland in your neck makes T4, which is the first hormone primarily that it makes, it converts into T3. But if you have cortisol issues, then you may not convert into that active T3 like you want to. So your blood test, your, your doctor runs a TSH and says, you're fine. Everything's fine. You're fine. And you're like, wait, hold on. I'm gaining weight. My hands and feet are cold and my hair is falling out. My skin is dry and I, I constipation. And, and then on further testing, we find, oh, you actually have a tough time converting to the active form, to the T3. And it's because your cortisol rhythm is all out of whack. You either don't have enough or you're, usually it's too much in an appropriate time getting in the way of this conversion. And, and yeah. when it's chronic, right. And when you have a stressful day, no big deal. You should, you should rebound. You should go back to baseline, but how many people have chronic stressors in their life, whether it's what they eat, where they work, their relationships, infections, you know, all this, the air they breathe, chemicals they use all the time. And so now all the time they have this cortisol dysfunction. And now that leads to a thyroid slowdown yes. essentially. And this is all part of this HP axis dysfunction, as yeah. we refer to it now. At what, yes. At some point, some Formally. people refer to it as adrenal fatigue. It's right. not the adrenals, but it's this brain. It's the brain. Right. Right. No, you can have. I mean, there's the there's the condition, right? There's Addison's sure. disease. So there's like there's true. You know, the adrenals can give out an autoimmune sense of Addison's, but but beyond that, you know, we. We um, use the term, like you said, adrenal fatigue all the time as if the glands on a day-to-day -day basis just gave out or decided to, like the ovary, right? The ovaries go right. into menopause and, and the adrenals, unless you have an autoimmune condition, if they don't. And, and so we can affect the, our, our cortisol rhythm simply by uh, an actual stressor, like if we get in a car accident or, you know, uh, financially, it's our perceived stressors as well. And so mm -hmm. that has to do with just the stuff going on in our life and how we internalize stress, which right. I don't, I mean, maybe you could talk to that about, you know, for a second in terms of what we have the ability to do with our mind <laughs> on our body's function. Yes. Yeah. And the body doesn't know the difference, which is what's right. so empowering and also crazy to me. So actual stress, um, uh, perceived stress and anticipated stress. So yes. It's, um, I have wonderful in-laws, but this is my, this is my analogy. So if your in-laws, if you don't like your in-laws and they stress you out and they're coming over, they actually are literally on their way over. That's actual stress, right? Your, your cortisol, your adrenaline goes up. <clears throat> oh, my in-laws are coming over. So everything in the body responds. The brain's like, oh, we don't, we don't like these people, you know, respond. But if you, if it's perceived stress, you know, if you're like, well, they're not coming over, but they always come over. Like, I'm sure they're going to come over. They'll probably come over. They're always over here but they're not actually coming over. It doesn't matter. The brain reacts the exact same way. Oh, in-laws, let's like, let's stress out. Okay. 
and you release cortisol and you release adrenaline. And then in, in, um, uh, it anticipated, so we've per, uh, actual anticipated and then perceived. So that last one was anticipated. Perceived yeah. is if they're nowhere around, they're out of town, they're not even in the same city as you, but yet they still stress you out. You think about them, you're like, oh my gosh, I couldn't imagine <laughs> them coming over. Right? It's the people who make mountains out of molehills. It's the people who yes. we, that spin in their brain over and over about something, um, whether it's real or not. It, it's if it's it's it becomes real to them. The brain doesn't know the difference, and it absolutely um, reacts. It put out, it, like, oh, cortisol, okay, norepinephrine, epinephrine, let's release. And so it's the power of our mind. Like if, if, it's not, if it's not actually happening, if it's perceived or anticipated, if it's not literally in front of you, then you, do, you can change, change, work to change your thinking, right? Work to change your stress response. Work to reprogram your brain that actual stress, you're about to get in a car accident, that's a real reason to react. Mm-hmm but making mountains out of molehills, spinning over things that haven't yet happened. Worst case scenario, people. Um, right. Right. Like I, we all know those people and they have tend to dump out a lot of cortisol and norepinephrine, epinephrine, cause they're spinning all the time. Are there ways that you, you know, help people manage those stressors or, or put those into perspective? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ways you just have to find that what resonates with that person I find. Right. So some people like counseling, some people like journaling, some people, yes like, uh, you know, reminders on their phone that will pop up to say, you know, like positive, positive mantras or what have you. Um, I do a lot of um, uh, Bach flower remedies, which Mm -hmm. I don't know, not a lot of people are familiar with the Bach flower remedies, but you can get them at Whole Foods and they're, they're, they're little um, dropper bottles. But one of them in particular is white chestnut and white chestnut is for people who ruminate over and over and over again. Um, over trivial things. And so I'll say, go to Whole Foods or get on Amazon. I have no affiliation. Buy white chestnut mm. and just take a couple drops several times throughout the day to help stop that ruminating. Take it before bed when your mind is spinning over just trivial stuff. What could have happened, what should have happened, what you should have said, what they might have said, what might happen tomorrow. So that's awesome. Um, that's one of my favorites. And there's, you know, there's some other stuff that's good for brain calming. Um, yeah. herbs and nutrients and stuff, but white chestnut's so easy. Well, I'm definitely going to have to try that because I think <laughs> my, my in-laws are actually on their way. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's a good note. Hey brother, are you struggling to find the energy to function at your best as a businessman, father, and husband? I want you to know you're not alone. And sadly, the conventional wisdom these days around healthy eating and exercise that has saturated the mainstream is flat out wrong. If you want to find the solution to optimizing your energy and body composition without restrictive dieting, soul crushing workouts, or adding more to your already stressful and overflowing schedule so that you can finally function like the man you know you can be, then we need to chat. Are you ready to move from exhausted to energized? by working smarter, not harder, go ahead and schedule your free strategy call at www.bslnutrition.com forward slash level up. I'm looking forward to our conversation and enjoy the rest of the show. Let's talk about the Dutch test a little bit and the power in doing cortisol testing. So two things, one is with this awakening response, um, how did because the the norm has been, as far as I understand it, mm-hmm. just testing, as you mentioned, upon waking, noon, mm-hmm. afternoon, evening, and I'm going to throw out a, a bunch of things at once here. So, and it's been salivary based. Mm-hmm. Talk to us about the Dutch test um, and the relevance of, of doing the Dutch testing and why it's different from some of the more conventional, I, I'll say yeah. conventional, but I don't know if salivary has been a conventional modality it, or not. The- Conventional in the functional world. <laughs> sure. Conventional in the functional versus, and this will say, okay, right. but versus, versus blood. Blood. That's You're right. right. So there's actually two parts of that question. One, so Dutch is an acronym. It stands for dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. So it's a, it's a test where you, you basically urinate on pieces of filter paper um, and let them, let them dry. And for women, I'm like, it's kind of like peeing on a pregnancy test and just letting it dry. Um, and for men, it's super easy. Cause you know, they just aim and get the right. filter paper wet. And so, they do that four times throughout the day, first thing in the morning or um, two hours later around dinner and before bed. And the great part about urine is you get all of the main hormones you're looking for, cortisol, DHEAS, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, what have you, 
for men and women, but with urine is when you get all the pathways and what's called the metabolites. So you make an estrogen, but where does it go? If you just get your blood drawn with estrogen, you know you make estrogen, but you don't know what pathway it's going down. And by pathway, I mean when you detoxify estrogen, you have some pathway options. It can get detoxed down. There's a healthier pathway. There's a cancerous pathway. Well, you kind of want to go down the healthy pathway. So by knowing that in urine, you get this bigger picture. Same with mm -hmm. testosterone and DHEAS. Um, there's a pathway that causes acne and hair growth in women in places they don't want, their chin, their upper lip. Um, the same pathway causes male pattern baldness. It causes prostate enlargement. So if you just get a, a blood draw for testosterone or a saliva test for testosterone in your, let's say your normal range, but you have acne and upper lip hair as a woman or male pattern baldness and prostate issues as a man, you're like, well, this doesn't tell me anything. But by knowing the pathway, I can say, oh, actually, you make normal levels, but what you do make, you go down this aggressive pathway and let's do things to stop it. Now, the second part of that question is cortisol. How do you do the cortisol, specifically cortisol awakening response, every 30 minutes? So in that case, we com combine urine, dried urine, with saliva swabs. Mm, so okay. it is a combination test. Because I mean, I mean, like some people could, but you, most women and men can't urinate every 30 minutes. <laughs> right. And there's a lag time because the cortisol is made, and then it has to get into the bladder, and then it has to come out. But with saliva, much like a blood draw, it's what's happening right in the minute. Or second, okay. or millisecond. And, and so, why is it better to get the urine than just a blood spot of the uh, of the cortisol? So when you get to, you know when you oh. get a, a blood test and they show cortisol, it, how relevant is it? Um, it's like it's like mildly relevant, <laughs> not greatly <laughs> relevant. So what people forget is that hormones are like children; they can't be unattended at any time. So most of your hormones in your blood are bound up. They're bound up to, you know, they're on a bus riding around. There's only a very small percentage of your hormones that are free. And the free hormones are what are able to bind to receptors and do the things. It's the free hormones that can do the actions in your body. So when you get a blood draw, it's a combination of what's bound up and what's free. So if you get a blood draw on your cortisol, it's just for easy numbers, say 10. You don't know if eight of that is bound up and two is free or two of that is bound up and eight is free. So you get a number of 10, like, well okay, but you, you don't really get to differentiate between the two. In saliva testing and in dried urine testing, you get the, bio, it's called bioavailable. You get a better picture of what's, what's free and active and that's what's doing the things. Gotcha. And so when somebody's stressed out or they have no energy or they're, you know, whatever for cortisol, the blood draw doesn't actually give me that much. Yeah. Rele it's like some information, but I'm like, ah, but I need relevant information. What's free and active and at what time is it being put out? And so based on the results, what can we do? So let's say someone has low morning cortisol and high evening cortisol, which yeah. would be inverted. What does that tell us uh, about their lifestyle and what can we do to, to correct those rhythms? We call it a reverse pattern or an inverse pattern. And so, and we see it all the time. That's probably a, one of the top patterns that we see. So people are super tired in the morning. They need caffeine. They hit the alarm several times. They drag. It takes them like an hour or so to get going, get their mind turned on. And then they go all day and then they can't fall asleep or stay asleep at night. They're, these are the people that are probably either eating, maybe eating late or maybe, you know, having alcohol or dessert late. Um, they're, they're up late because their kids went to bed. They're up late because they're working. They're on their computer. They're watching TV. They're on their phone. Um, they're getting stimulated even if they don't feel stimulated by all that bright light and and so their cortisol goes up and stays up and so we we just basically have to reverse that we have to flip the pattern is what we do so in these people i'm like you need light in the morning mm -hmm. when you have high, low cortisol in the morning the easiest simplest cheapest method is when you when your alarm goes off and it's going to take a couple weeks to ingrain this in your brain but get some sunlight in, in your eyes. It, um, this isn't like vitamin D where you need it on your skin. <laughs> yeah, you're getting, yeah. So you can open your drapes. And if you're in a sunny place, go out on your deck, go on your patio, go out on your porch, open your window and get some sunlight in, into your eyeballs. And that helps exponentially, but don't wait, don't like get dressed and take, you know, to eat breakfast and, and then do it, like do it right away. This is where you can also buy um, those um, uh, full spectrum light bulbs. Yeah. Right. So I live in, um, Portland, Oregon, and we get sun like the month of July and sometimes August and that's it. Right. So, w w you know, my patients and colleagues here said, you know, there's no sun, Carrie. I'm like, well, go fake it <laughs> and go buy full yeah. spectrum light bulbs that mimic the sunlight, turn it on, you know, turn them on in the morning, buy a box. They, they come in like kits and boxes and stuff. 
Um, again, I don't have any affiliation. Go to Amazon, read the reviews, go to your hardware store and check them out. But then the reverse you do at night. So you do the sunlight in the morning and at night I tell people low dim, dim lights, um, wear the blue light blocking glasses, right? Get, get off your phone an hour before bed, get off your computer. Um, there, I don't know if it's for Android, but for iPhone, there's the hack where you can turn the background screen red, um, for, as opposed to that, like sort of white blue light. And again, there's all these, there's cheater methods, you know, but the best is just to get off of it. So an hour before bed, start to wind down. Don't, don't watch TV. Don't be on your screen, any screen, even your e-reader, go back to real books and, um, wind down and get darkness that helps to trigger cortisol to go down. So we're just flipping when the lightness mm -hmm. happens. Uh, correlation between people that have moved, um, from, abroad so let's say someone from australia moves to the u.s and they're living uh -huh. in the u.s have you seen issues with ad uh, adapting their circadian rhythms based on their country of origin over a um, long so time? actually a friend of mine who was australian was living in canada and she just moved back to sydney where it's um at the time of recording it's their summer it's their summertime yeah. and um the stress of moving was quite stressful but she went from snow and cold and dark She's on the beach every day. I hate her. And so like, so, so that part of her adjustment is going really, really well because sure. now she's getting all this, this great sunshine and she's out of the dark and the cold and, and I'm super jealous. And so it's actually very, that's a positive, it's helping the move stress from moving from one country to another country because she gets all this bright sunshine and her sleep is better. So it's the, re I agree. It's the reverse. When people come from very sunny places, um, Hawaii, Australia, yeah. islands, other islands, and they move like to Seattle, Portland, or Montana in the winter, they struggle. Yeah. They struggle. And it doesn't even have to be other countries. I have, um, my old neighbors were from Florida, Southern Florida, and they moved to Portland in the dead of winter. And they were like, what did we do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is this? I'm like, go buy a happy light. <laughs> go buy full spectrum lights. Go yeah. home. Why did you move here? <laughs> Why did you? Well, I moved from Minnesota to Phoenix. And so that was a good decision considering the amount of sunlight. I don't know that I could ever move back, even though yeah. all my friends have nine months of winter, forget it. Right. I lived, I lived for a year in Portland. I went to Lewis and Clark my freshman year of college. Oh, no uh, kidding. And, uh, nope, wasn't for me. <laughs> Although that, that, the mountain did get a lot of snow and I snowboard. So yes. that was, that was a good it's, year for, for snowboarding. Yeah. People, I've been here 19 years. I'm not from here, but I've been here long enough that I just say I'm from here. Um, and they'll say, like, why are you still there? I'm like, well, two things. One, it's gorgeous. I mean, it it's absolutely cool. stunning. Our mountains are beautiful. I'm, we have, you know, the ocean's an hour, hour and a half from me. The mountain is about an hour and a half from me. And you, you can see the mountains everywhere. It's fantastic. Um, and two, we, uh, my husband and I have a short-term um, exit plan. Like, we are probably headed to Phoenix oh, <laughs> at some right point. On. Yeah. So yeah, two of our point. best friends live in Phoenix. Our other friend is looking to move to Phoenix. And so we'd at the very least like to snowbird. I mean, our... Our like five-year plan is to snowbird young. <laughs> well, it's a good place to be. Phoenix good is where we're looking. <laughs> I'm staring at the sunshine right now. So, oh, not me. <laughs> it's um, raining. <laughs> okay, so I want to I want to talk about training intensity and um, dieting, so to speak, and its impact on hormones and cortisol. Specifically, what I'm encountering a lot with with clientele is this, especially females, especially. Mm -hmm. um, middle-aged females is this mentality of dieting, dieting, training, training, especially with uh, CrossFit and, right. and it becoming uh, acceptable for women to start to train really hard. What we're seeing is, is women are starting to train really hard, which I think is great, but they're doing it at the same time as implementing this dieting mindset. And we're right. getting this discrepancy between, you know, uh, exercise output, calorie output, and, and uh, nutritional intake, caloric input. Yeah. And it's, it's wreaking havoc. It's um, wrecking their hormones. Can yeah. you talk about how that impacts uh, cortisol, thyroid a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was at a lecture. Do you know um, Dr. Felice Gersh? I don't. Um, she's a MD OBGYN out of Los Angeles, and she is a brilliant lecturer. And she was talking about, she said, you know, ladies, whether you like it or whether you're whether you're trying to get pregnant or not, your your whole purpose of your female body 
is reproduction, wh whether you want to or not, right? Like we can hack it, we can do, we can prevent it and we can do all these things, but that's the driving force. So when you, when you lower calories, when you do extreme dietary changes and when you, when you do excessive exercise, the body is trying to preserve reproduction. And so your reproductive hormones get damaged the most. And I, and I thought, I, I, I'd known it and I'd lectured about it, but she just said it so simply, you know, like whether you are looking to get pregnant or not, like it doesn't matter. Your whole, unfortunately, your biological drive is, is reproduction. So your body's going to preserve, uh, try to preserve ovulation and try to preserve these, the cycling of hormones. And when you, when you do all these excessive things, like they go south because mm -hmm. it's, it's one or the other right? Yeah. And you end up doing more harm than good. Now, having said that, what I think people forget is when they do this excessive exercise is, and especially um, CrossFit, I see all the time, but it's also the cardio bunnies. I, yes. Right. You. And when you're running from, when you're stressed out, our analogy is you're running from the tiger. So if you're always literally running, whether you're on the treadmill or the elliptical, or you're a marathoner or a 5k or what have you, um, and you're not taking care of yourself and you're not eating enough, then you are literally going to screw up your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis because you are literally running from the tiger all the time and, and not nourishing yourself. And so that starts to go south. And then as a result, the thyroid, the, the thyroid is your main, um, you know, met metabolite, metabolism and, and energy um, is, is what the thyroid does, plus mm -hmm. everything else, right? And cortisol and ovaries and testicles and everything in your body. So it starts to go south because it's, again, try, everything's trying to preserve itself because you're actually doing more harm than good. And when you do more harm than good, you go into preservation and instead of elation. And so everything starts to go down. And so now you start to get thyroid problems. Women are like, I'm actually gaining weight. I'm doing CrossFit and I'm gaining weight or I'm, my hair is starting to fall out. I'm like, I know, I know because you're, you're, you're pushing. I, I am proud of you for doing the exercise. I'm proud of you for like getting all into it. And this is, you love your, this, your, your exercise family and you're trying to get healthy, but, um, a little too extreme. Like we, we need to dial it back and, and, and change it up a little bit because your body is reacting as if it's a massive stressor. Yes. And massive stressors shut everything down. I, I'm glad you brought up the, the weight gain standpoint because the frustration lies, and this is men too, mm -hmm. the frustration lies in I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing, quote unquote, but I'm not losing weight and or I'm gaining weight. And then down the road is, and now I'm starting to crash a la digestive mm -hmm. issues, sleep mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. Injury. Injury, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and so helping people understand this dynamic between the thyroid and their calorie input and their exercise output. And it's like you said, the actual perceived anticipated stressors of they're stressing the body out physically, but they're also mentally stressing quite a bit about should I eat this, should I eat that? Right. Um, and this is on top of their already stressful life. Work, right. Like too. I would say most Americans um, or most people in first, first world countries seem to have a lot of stress. <laughs> and yeah. then, so you might think to yourself, you know what, to release some stress or get healthy, I'm going to go do this exercise. But instead of going easing into it, I'm, I'm going to go 10 out of 10, right? I'm going to, I'm going to go right. all in. I'm, a, I'm an all or nothing type A person. And so now you just added more onto that in a, in an unhealthy manner. Yeah. And, and you know, it's unhealthy because the body's rebelling. You're gaining weight, you're tired, you're crashing, you've got injuries, you you know, you, all this other stuff. You're, you're unhappy, your mood is changing. I mean, you're, like, you're just like you said, I don't understand I'm doing anything right. Like, well, you know, everyone's an individual and right. And, rebelling, cut back. And it's just that it's just, it's just, uh, you know, swiping away the conventional wisdom of eat less, do more mm -hmm. and understanding that for many people with everything that we're bombarded with on a daily basis, it's this less is more mentality needs mm -hmm. to start to fit in. Um, and understanding like, Hey, it's okay to not train for a week or two weeks, mm -hmm. especially if your caloric intake is going to be low, because that will allow your body to adjust to the calories and, and rest and recover and focus on sleep and some mm -hmm. self care and stuff like that. And then when you do decide to bring back training, well, then you need to mirror that with your caloric intake so mm -hmm. that your hormonal output can function optimally so that you're fueling your body effectively and you're no longer in this 
fight or flight mode, sympathetic nervous system overdrive right. all the time. And that's, right. uh, I mean, for me, that's the hardest thing about getting people to understand is, especially, I'm sure you work with a lot of type A people as do I, <laughs> right? Yeah, totally. They want results. They want results now. Mm-hmm. And um, they're just not understanding why that the output uh, isn't isn't lining up especially from a right. caloric standpoint and i and they'll be frustrated and i understand like maybe they've sustained for a while you know and i'm sure you have this too men and women come in and they'll say i'm doing this exercise program whatever it is weightlifting crossfit running you know i don't care um hit training and then they'll say i've been doing so well for the last year or six months or two years and now i feel i've hit a wall now i'm super you know like why was it so good for all that time and now it's a problem, and I'm in, and I'm, and like it's a, it's like a, a bell curve, right? right? Like you went up the bell curve, and you found you found the peak at the top of the bell, or the, the sweet spot at the top of the pel- the bell curve, but you, like you can only sustain that for so long. The body can only meet you halfway for so long, and then it's like, ooh, this isn't working for me anymore. This is two years of too much, or six months of too much, or whatever it is. Yep, and then it's it's it, then it's taking a step back and really evaluating what you've been doing for. Mm-hmm for months or years uh, and then backtracking and, and unwinding the, the, the damage. Right. Uh, and, and it's hard, yes. right? It's hard for a type A person to stop. <laughs> to chill. <laughs> to slow it, down. It, right. I, I get it. It's everything because everything they do is so yang and mm-hmm. there's no yin. And, and when you talk to them, uh, I obviously have a couple of people that I'm working with right now that are in this situation, but, uh, but it's so many of us you know, to, to just add more yin to the yang and, and doing those mindfulness techniques and the things that we just talked about as far as figuring out ways to wind down. And like you right. said, you know, the Bach flower remedies or sleeping more or uh, meditation or journaling. I, I love gratitude journals. Yeah. Yeah. As or just go to- for a walk. You know, I tell, you know, people are just floored. I'm like, just go for a walk. Just walk around your neighborhood. But like, go for a walk. What do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, just go check out what your neighbors are doing. Like literally just relax. Yep. It's good. So let's circle back to fasting. Yes. Have you, have you utilized any fasting techniques with, with clientele? Um, n- no, I haven't. I haven't. This is just a, a sheer experiment that you're playing around with. It is. And it, because it's been gaining, I, Oh, I should take it back. I haven't, exp- I have not done any, um, like water fasting with patients okay. or I haven't done, um, this particular fasting mimicking diet intermittent fasting um, sure. or time restricted feeding I have talked with about with patients multiple times um, but actually like okay we're gonna go on a consciously decided fast of some sort for however many days um, I haven't with patients what do you think what what are your biggest lessons from that your experience with this five day uh, fast mimicking diet um, apparently, uh, I like food a whole lot more than I thought I did <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> because when you have that craving, even, even if I'm not I'm so much hungry, but I, I'll think to myself, oh, I can eat, you know, I, I should probably, I'm going to get a snack. I'm kind of hungry. I'm like, oh, nope, can't. Nope. Sure can't. But I guess I'll make tea, <laughs> drink a lot of water. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's been a big one. Um, I just, is just as for me personally, um, I am just an N of one. Um, I, because I didn't get all the wonderful, amazing feelings that so many of my friends and colleagues got. I don't know that I'll do this again, uh, to be honest. I know I got a message from somebody who said, you know, oh, are you doing this for weight loss? Are you doing this for, um, you know, that in, that sort of to jumpstart weight loss? I was like, nope, definitely not for weight loss. In fact, the whole this whole um, uh, fasting mimicking diet was more for longevity is what, right? That's what all the research is on, longevity stuff. That's right. And so, um, but my, this is, this is terrible. So most of my family lives until their 80s or 90s, late 80s or 90s. And I'm like, I kind of already I'm <laughs> good. I'm <laughs> good. <laughs> and, I, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to keep doing this, but I know folks who've done it three times, four times. Why one, in fact, one of the um, creators has done it 13 times. And she wrote me and said, I'm going into my 13th time. I was like, good God, 13. But she feels incredible when she does it. So good honor. I 
I don't know. I, it's not my favorite thing. But, but so, so with that is, have you experimented with any aspects of intermittent fasting? Oh yeah, I do. I do intermittent fasting. Okay. Yeah. I do 12 or 14 hours. Some, sometimes okay. by mistake or accident or, you know, just life and scheduling, I make it longer, but 12 to 14 hours is kind of my sweet spot for intermittent fasting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what I do. I, I think that it's a, it's almost like a, a skill is the longer you go fasting or the more frequently you do it, the better you get at it, the more yeah. comfortable you get with the feelings associated. Yeah. It's one of the things that I'm learning because I play around with this stuff. So this is my second time doing this in the last six months or so. And I'm a lot more comfortable with my levels of hunger than I was mm-hmm. previously. Mm-hmm. By that same token is just experimenting with days of intermittent fasting where it's maybe a, a a 20 hour or a 24 hour fast is the more frequently you do it, uh, the more comfortable you get with it. Yeah. And so I think that aside from all of the different brain and body and cellular and longevity benefits that we find with intermittent fasting for a lot of people, it's just a great opportunity to tune in to how they're actually feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, to and to start to really get comfortable with what it actually feels like to be hungry, right? Because I firmly, uh, I'm, I'm confident that not many people understand what that's like. And right. as a population, we just eat too much, too frequently, to and the degree of totally. And this falls right. right back into the circadian rhythms. Mm-hmm. Is like the sun goes down, you're likely not eating very much. In fact, that's time to get ready right. for bed and. We know that generally it's not um, a very good thing to be eating a lot of food before bed, which tells right. me that you know our ancestry probably wasn't eating very late right. into the day or much past sundown. And so if you start to think about it that way, it really starts to shorten this eating window, mm-hmm. which I believe for you know for most of most people, if they simply could do that, mm-hmm. shorten their eating window, especially at night, it would they'd be so much better off from a just an overall health standpoint, an insulin management standpoint, right. obviously a weight standpoint, um, and uh, and a total caloric intake. Like we'd just be massively reduced because most people consume the majority of their calories from the, from the time they get home from work until they go to yep. bed, anyways. Yep. Yeah. Between that and the alcohol, right? They're just uh, yeah, hundred percent. Drink, make dinner, have dinner, have you know? They'll snack while they're watching TV. Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, guess that's. A really good point though. Definitely you get, uh, like I said, my, well, I said to you before we started this, my hunger the very first day was out of control, but it was, that was mostly mind game. I, because I knew I couldn't eat. I couldn't go snack if I wanted to. And so it was, it took about a day to get over. And then after that, I would, ha- I feel like I have normal hunger pains, despite the fact that it's only about 800 calories. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I'm exponentially hungry or starving all the time. I have had some people write me and say they felt starving the whole time. And I think um, your satiety uh, mechanism is also hormonally driven, and very much so. You know, in those cases, I'm like, wow, it seems like this would be a good thing for you to do. Implement a couple times over just to rebalance that satiety message. Like, oh, I'm full, or oh, I'm not. Um, because I think uh, a lot of people don't have the appropriate full trigger, or they don't wait for it to come and they just keep eating, and then they're too full. Right now, they're stuffed. Yeah. Or they're, or they're just, it's habitual or they're just bored or they're thirsty right. or it's just like, Hey, I know when I walk in the door from, from work, it's been a long stressful day. I, I grab that beer, glass of wine and the, the crackers and the chips mm-hmm. or whatever. And it's just like, I don't even think about it. I just do it. And right. so when you can start to frame that stuff and, and understand why you're doing what you're doing and give people a, an excuse to analyze those habits. I think it's a very valuable thing. Again, aside from of the yeah. benefits that we're starting to see, even though it's kind of in its infancy. Um, so I guess with that said, what's going to be your first meal? <laughs> Cause I, I I'll, I'll, I'll preface by saying I typically ask my guests what, if they could have one meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, if they could only have one meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the rest of their life, what would that meal be? But we'll spin it differently and say, what is going to be your first meal after you know breaking this fast? Yeah, well, so transition day, right, because I'm following the program because I'm, I'm a research guinea pig. So transition day, they're like, you need to start out with liquids, smoothies, soups, and then by the end of the day, you can have 
you know, vegetables or rice and what have you. So my first food will be um, a smoothie, <laughs> which mm. right at this point I'm pretty excited about. Now, interestingly, the entire time I've been doing this fast, I've had no sugar cravings, which I'm, I'm not really a sugar eater. I mean, I like, I like dark chocolate, but I feel like dark chocolate is more medicinal than, than anything. Um, but I haven't had any sugar uh, chocolate cravings and I have chocolate in the house that I've never been like, I could have just this one piece, but I tell you what this morning, um, I thought to myself, I'll be really glad to have a piece of chocolate tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will be really glad to have that one piece of dark chocolate. That will be great. <laughs> well, I I'll tell you that the smoothie sounds terribly unsatisfying. I know, uh, but so it's, it's transition day. So I have uh, again for, cause I'm a research guinea pig. I have to I follow. The plan to keep make sure my hormone, my testing is all going to be on the up and up. So um, I've so they probably dive face first into something like Thai food. Or <laughs> thank you. Something. Well, I so I've been tracking body composition because I'm very interested to see what the god body composition changes mm. are. So I did an in body assessment on Monday morning. So that an in body tracks your weight, your skeletal muscle mass, your lean, mm. uh, your your percent body fat, um, and your extracellular water to. Um, total body water composition. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, I'll be interested. I, I won't be doing that again until Monday. So I'm going to keep the reins tight through mm -hmm. the weekend, but um, I'll be interested to see that, but no smoothie for me. I'll definitely be having a steak, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell Heck you, yeah. <laughs> but I'll tell you the hardest thing. I have three kids and oh. my, my wife is doing with me. So one is the hardest thing is just dealing with my wife. Um, she's not a happy camper. Um, oh, she has a lot bigger blood sugar swings and she's, she's been a trooper, but she's, she's doing great. She's noticing a big difference, especially with digestive health and bloating. But I think it's so interesting that you brought that up, um, about the cravings. Um, we're, you know, as we film this, this is right after the holidays. It's mm -hmm. been a few weeks. I've been eating a lot more sugar than I'm used to and getting a lot more cravings to the degree where typically after a meal, I'll crave something sweet, you know, right. it's chocolate right. or something. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because I've had zero cravings whatsoever. I think it's, um, it's pretty interesting. So I'm definitely going to uh, keep riding that wave of, mm -hmm. of trying to keep the, the nutrition pretty tight for the time being and play around with this momentum. But, um, with that said, uh, Dr. Terry Jones, where can people find out more about you and how can we access the Dutch test? <laughs> well, thankfully, it's really easy. It's dutchtest.com, um, dutchtest.com. And so uh, if you are a practitioner, you can sign up for an account. If you are a patient, you can read all about it. All of our educational videos and webinars and everything, uh, including this when it comes out, will be on there. It's uploaded. And, um, but where people f can find me, I hang out the most on Instagram. So I'm dr.carryjones. That's my handle, dr.carryjones. And I, it's all education. It's all I do on hormones and cortisol and for m mostly men, I mean, for mostly women, but I do a lot of male stuff too. Just can't no, forget about our men. So it's, it's a great resource. It's a great resource. So if you guys want to learn more about, Specifically female hormones, but there's all kinds of hormonal stuff, uh, cortisol stuff. Uh, really, you've got a great um, Instagram stories about your experience with the prolon. Yeah. Fast yeah. mimicking diet. So if you guys want to learn more about that specifically, uh, the prolon patented form specifically, then you can go check that out. And um, Dr. Jones, thank you so much for yeah. taking the time to come on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm glad it worked out and Zoom cooperated. <laughs> yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. We'll have to do it again Likewise. soon. And I'll look forward to connecting with you again. Take Perfect. care. Perfect. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. Did you love this episode of the Smart Nutrition Made Simple show? Then head on over to iTunes, subscribe, and leave a positive rating and review. And more importantly, share this with other men that you know are dedicated to leveling up in every area of their life by learning how to live healthier, more energetic and productive lives so that they can optimize their health for their family and future. Thank you for listening. And if you want to find out more about how you can work directly with Ben, then just head on over to www.bslnutrition.com forward slash level up.